loving theme. Are you ready for The Weavers by Emily Inkpen? Emily, if I make any mistakes, I'm sorry. I have done like 15 of these so far and I keep panicking that I'm doing it wrong. But I swear I am trying my absolute best and I wanted to get perfect. So if I still manage to do a few mess up, I blame my neurodivergences. So just blame, 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 bear with me. <laughs> it's one of those tonight. But as you can see, I got my snuggie on and I am ready for a little bit of a cold chill to run down my back as I read this bad boy. So let us begin. This is The Weavers by Emily Inkpen. Franny said they wouldn't get lost, but that was before the smog came down. They'd gone out for bread and taken a turn and now they were somewhere in Seely. I could scatter crumbs from the crust in my pockets so we can see where we've been. This isn't that kind of story, Herb. Don't be silly, Franny snapped. We went the wrong way, that's all. Franny didn't like to admit when she'd made a mistake, but on this occasion, the mistake admitted both of them freely. They'd walked innocently into a wide, hungry mouth and its sharp teeth held wide. Ma Robin says one wrong turn is all it takes in this part of London. Then the streets all look the same and it's all you can do to find your way, Herb whispered. Shivering against the cold, watching wisps of thick yellow fog drift before them. These streets look like our streets, but they're not our streets, Franny replied, and they go on forever. Are we going the right way now, Herb asked, looking around at the murky houses. We tried going back, but the way we came isn't here anymore. It feels like we're further in. If it's that kind of story, we have to find our way through, Herb said. His sister clicked her tongue impatiently. Why does this have to be a story at all? Ma Robbins says that every day is a new story. Well, Ma Robbins isn't here, is she? Franny puts her hands on her hips and stares around. Ma Robbins' Christmas dinner would begin shortly. Under her red coat, Franny was wearing her best red dress with the white collar and Herbie had forced into a tie, a red one. Franey studied a street sign, her dark ringlets bobbing. Hmm, Warren Way. We must have turned off one street too early when the smog came down. If we did, we'd be on dead, ugh, dead end lane, Herb pointed out. Not such a dead end, Franny said. Listen. What? It's silent. Rows of houses, each has a light on in the window, but there's no sound. Can, can you hear anything? Herb shrugged. When the smog falls, people go inside. But the ones who are outside make a lot of noise because they can't see anything, Franny sighed. Took a trailing tendril from her spindly brown plant growing above the street sign and tied a knot in it. So we're going through, Herb guessed. I suppose it's that kind of story, Franny said, throwing a dark ringlet over her shoulder in a business-like manner. Evenly spaced gas lamps hissed overhead and their footsteps echoed off the houses to either side. The terrace seemed to go on forever. An endless parade of bare blackened brick, broken by a window, a door, a window, a door, all of them opening straight onto the street. Every window glowed dully through the smog, the hard lines of the frames and sashes obscured from view. Glancing upwards, it was difficult to see how tall the buildings were. It might have been that they went on, up, 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 forever. Franey, are the houses getting closer? Herb whispered. Franey stopped and looked around. No, Herb, you're imagining things, I think. You should listen to the boy, said a high cracked voice, making them both jump. Where there had been nothing and no one, an indistinctive figure now stood leaning against the nearest lamppost. 
What are you? Herb asked, loudly, his voice echoing in the eerie silence. Herb, Franny cried. I am so sorry. What my brother meant to ask was, who are you? The figure cackled. <laughs> Your brother had it right, Herb, is it? Yes. Herb took a step forward, but Franey dragged him back. Both a little lost, aren't you? We're fine, thank you, Franey snapped. You should be getting along home yourself. Oh? Um, the figure straightened up and snapped its fingers. Herb closed his eyes tight and when he opened them again, he and Franey were standing in direct lamplight. The figure appeared to be no more than a boy, wearing rough clothes, frayed weight, waistcoat, short trousers, held up with a string and a shirt that looked like it had never seen a collar. The string was looped around several times and a length of it lay coiled on the ground beneath his tattered thin boots. His pinched, pointed face and yet sharp yellow brown eyes were fixed on her. Little Seelies, he cackled. No, Franey snapped. That's not it. We're on our way home, that's all. Oh, well, you can walk and walk along this road and you won't get anywhere at all. It's best to take a turn if you want to go somewhere. We're going east, Franey said. No, you've gone east, the boy corrected her. You're in east. The east end. East ends here. So where's west? Herb asked. The boy shrugged. Who needs West? Franey sighed irritably. We we do. We should go back the way we came. Why would that help? The boy asked, taking hold of a lamppost and swinging around it, trailing the string behind him. Because if we don't want to go east, we need to go west, and west is the other way. No, it isn't, the boy replied. You're in East now, so even if you go the other way, you'll still be in the East. First, you have to find your way at the East. Then you can choose which direction to go in. Franny folded her arms. That's not how directions work. The boy stopped mid-swing, his face inches from hers. Isn't it? The gas lamp flickered and Herbie gasped. For one split second, the boy's clothes were richly embroidered and the string that had been trailing behind him, lifeless and limp, became a greenish tail that flexed and twitched. Franey must have seen it too, for she took a step backwards and stared. Take a turn, any turn, the boy cackled and danced away into the smog, the string whipping at his heels. Well, um, of all the impertinent... We need to take a turn, Franny. Franny took Herb's hand. It's all right, we found our way east. West has to be around here somewhere. They continued along the street, their breaths condensing in the cold air after what felt like a long while. A turning appeared. Weaver's Way, Franny read thoughtfully. What was this? A length of yellowish white thread was looped around the nearest lamppost and stretching, glittering with frost to a fence on top of the street. Patches of it widening into a crochet work before returning to a plain thread. It floated off down the street and disappeared into the smog. Franey reached out. Don't touch it, Franey, Herb said, but it was too late. Don't be silly, it's just cotton string. I don't think anything is just anything in the East, he whispered. It must be tied to something. Her voice trailed away. Perhaps someone put it here to help them find their way. Well, those people weren't us, Herb said. Franey held tight to his hand, hooked a finger over the line and stepped forward. Another lamp appeared ahead and from that one, what? more white threads looped away into the darkness. Franey giggled. This is fun. She selected another thread and followed it but only got a few steps before Herb, Herb tripped. How 
Oh, you little blue brother trip. Shame on you, Franny. There are Freds on the ground, he said, squinting down. Franny frowned. We need to be careful where we tread. You watch our feet and I'll watch ahead. They continued, stepping over and ducking under cross threads, which grew thicker the further they went. Under the next lamppost loomed out of the fog. It hissed and spluttered, bound tight with twine. Loops and stretches of crochet were woven overhead, mixed with intricate yellowed lacework and drapes of loose knitted wool. Pale threads running in all directions up and down the street. It seemed to have come together in this tattered collection. As they gazed at the eerie tangle before them, one thick line of crochet stitching started to twitch. A wisp stretch of lace pulled unnaturally, moved by one of the delicate lines that held it in place. The thread Franny had a hold of jerked out of her hand and she stifled a scream. When the loop and the swath of twine and wool and cotton had been as still as an ivory carving. They were now alive, dancing and pulling and twitching with eager rhythm, all of their own. Carphony, the cacophony of movement had not produced a single sound. Now a rhythmic clicking broke the silence. Franey pulled her close. The sound echoed again, a fast-paced Franey? Yes, Herb. Can you see anything? No, I can't. When I say the word, run. We can't, Franey. We'll trip on all the threads. The clicking stopped abruptly and the threads fell still once more. Well, 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 look who found their way into our home on a foggy night. The woman's voice was soft like a whisper that snapped at every syllable. Franey and Herb span around to see a tall lady wearing a black dress. She had a large black bonnet on her head and a thick black ringlet, which hung to either side of her face, completely obscured by a close veil of mourning. She hooked her skirt up and stepped sideways over a thread. We... Uh, I'm sorry for disturbing you, Franey stammered. Please, um, tell us... Which way is west? Or at least, how do we leave the east? The widow tilted her head and her ringlets twitched. Leave east? Not with this thicket, Smog, to find your way through. Y'all get caught in the threads and y'all... They're even thicker up ahead. Her voice was soft and rasped with every syllable. Franny looked like she was about to say something, but she closed her mouth tight. Good call, Franny. That's right, the widow said, rotating smoothly. Her long skirt brushed the ground. Come with me. A wind will blow along the river soon enough and the smog will lift. Until then, I have somewhere warm and safe for you to sit and wait and think about east and west and all the other places that are not here and now. Herb gave Franny a shove. Yes, ma'am, thank you, she mumbled and took a small step forward. That's right, go on. Sounds like, I do apologise, sounds like the worm from Blackburn's Dunny. Come inside, have a cup of tea with the missus. The widow whispered. They followed her, ducked under the looping, knotted fibres, and stepped over the taut warp-like lines. The houses on this street were larger, with steps up to each front door, and the windows of the house they approached were open, and the pale lamps that crossed the street ran uninterrupted inside. Miss Secta, we are visitors, the widow said, flicking a length of wool and click, click, clicking her way inside. Look what the smug bought us! They stepped over the threshold and blinked through a new kind of gloom as the widow turned and disappeared further into the house, leaving them with their new host, an older lady, dressed in elaborately patterned cream and dress, uh, brown dress, softly illuminated by the pale light provided by a single lamp. She looked at them through a pair of thick glasses, her knitting needles flashing too fast for Herb to make out. 
corner in which she sat was so thickly draped with intricate cloths of woven strands that it was difficult to see where the wall would be. If indeed it was there at all, I mean, for on looking around, both Franey and Herb realised no fragment of wall, ceiling, no surface, no items, no furniture, of which there were few, had been left clear of the tangled mess. The lamp stood on a flattened pile of fibres, illuminating Miss Sector's work. A thread twitched through the window and she tapped it gently as though to soothe its troubles. Franny finally found a voice. Oh, we're sorry, ma'am. We never meant to disturb anyone. Miss Sector peered at them. You must be cold, dears. Come here, let me wrap you in my weaving. The smog chills one so. Franny sat down on the floor beside her and swiftly, dexterously, she unrolled a pale scarf-like length of stitching and wrapped Franny tight. There, now that's better. The click, click, clicking of the widow grew louder once more and she appeared in the doorway. Ah, I see you've found and taken care of the girl, Miss Sector. Miss Sector seemed to be too busy knitting to reply. Her felt too sharp and tips on his shoulder and sank onto the fluffy spring floor the widow settled beside him on a thickly draped yet spindly chair where she swaddled him in a soft crochet shawl you'll be comfortable there my child she crooned herb looked back across the room towards franey and as the gas lamps flickered he gave a start for a moment Miss Sector's glasses and her curled hair became a collection of glistening eyes that covered the top of her head. The braids looped under her ears, appearing to be pincers. He blinked, and the lamplight settled once more. I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss, ma'am, Franey said to the widow, her voice as thin as the many threads that bound her. My loss, the widow whispered. Franny Blush, you, you, you're in mourning. Oh, I'm not a real widow, the widow replied. I dress as one, but I'm not one. You can see the difference if you look closely. Herb would have looked at her close-veiled face, but her hands distracted him. Her hands or her needles, both or neither, for even allowing for the wide lace leaves of her dress... He could see no fingers, only a single sharp black pointed needle with a slightly hooked end protruding from each. There were no swiftly turning at the lacework across a board on her knee. Where did you get all the thread? Herb asked, gazing at the thickly draped ceiling. What an interesting question. There's no need to worry about wool and cotton and thread and twine or yarn here, my dear. There's always plenty of what we need, Miss Sector replied. Herb looked at his sister, who frowned back and shrugged through her thick wrappings. The lamp hissed and flickered, and Franey's eyes, fixed on the widow, widened as in horror. Franey, I think the smog is lifting, Herb said. Wind yet, Miss Sector replied with a sharp snap to her voice. If there's no wind, lift it, then it hasn't lifted. You just stay there where it's snug and warm. And Franey wriggled a little. No, really, I think we ought to be getting on our way now. Where to, my dear? For you don't know your way. The bliss, the best place for you, my children. It's right here where you are, Miss Sector began, but her voice trailed away as almost every thread leading out the window tightened and released, tightened and released. Both weavers tilted their heads. What was that, Miss Sector? The widow asked. I don't know, my love, Miss Sector replied. The threads tightened and released, tightened and released, and Mrs. Sector shuffled to the edge of her thickly draped seat, dragging her overly large bustle behind her. The widow placed her lacework by her side and stood up, click, 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 clicking around to the open door. 
The thread tightened and released, tightened and released, and Mrs. Sector rose and crossed the room to stand beside her companion. The threads tightened and released, tightened and released, tightened and released. Both of them moved a little further forward, and as they did so, the boy, Franey and Herbert met earlier that day, slipped into the house. He grinned down at them and placed a long, pale finger against his lips. Threads continued to tighten and release, and Miss Sector and the widow moved slowly down the steps onto the street. Well, well, little Seelies, you're in a tangle, the boy said, producing a short knife from inside his waistcoat. What are you doing here, Franny snapped. I'm here to rescue you, he said with a wide grin. When I told you to turn off from the road, I didn't think you'd come down here. Nobody from East goes near the Weavers, but then you're not. From the east, are you? Franny shook her head. Can you move? The boy asked. Not well. I can free you for a price. What price? The boy placed the tip of the knife against his lower lip and leered at them. Only a lock of your hair. Is that all? Well, yeah. Payment will suffice. All right. <laughs> I'll give you a lock of my hair once we're safe. The boy nodded. You have to move fast, follow me, and don't touch the threads. The weavers are blind, you see. None of them know where you are unless you trip on one of their lines. Herb looked at Franey, who nodded. What's making the thread twitch? Oh, a friend of mine is dancing at the top of the lamppost, the boy said, casually twirling the knife between his fingers. He pulls on the threads and keeps them occupied when I need him to. Now, are you ready? Franey and Herb nodded and the boy clicked his long fingers. Both children found themselves unbound standing next to him as a frantic hissing rose up outside. Run! the boy commanded, and they followed him through the front door, down the steps and back along the street. A number of women scuttled back and forth across the road, each searching for a thing unknown, each moving unusually fast. The party of escapees had just drawn level with the lamppost when Herb tripped on a line. Bloody Herb! The boy froze and Franey followed suit. The hissing died down and the rhythmic clicking of the widow echoed through the silence. As Herb straightened up, taking care not to touch any more lines, he better bloody not, he realised what had been wrong about the sound all along. There were too many feet moving too quickly under a skirt. Well, no, really. You just realised that with the clicking. The widow found the thread and tapped it with a hooked needle, her head tilting as though waiting a response. Herbie held his breath as he ran the needle along the line towards him. The gas lamp hissed and flickered and the black knot down the front of her dress had corseted waist and her large, round and pronounced brussel revealed themselves for what they really were. The cleverly disguised anatomy of an enormous spider. Even the dark ringlets hanging to either side of her face now appeared to be sharp, polished pincers, twitching and quivering in the spitting light. Herb swallowed his horror, holding both his breath and his life. The thread tightened and released and the widow's head snapped back to the lamppost. She scuttled away and Herb ducked under the line to rejoin the others. They set off. As a guide moved from lamppost to shadow and back again, his clothes changed through a myriad of hues. In the spluttering, ugh, in the sputtering light, his hair became a shock of rich auburn, and his greenish skin shimmered with gold. As he twisted and turned, somersaulted and leapt, he snapped his long fingers, and brightly coloured Jay swooped through the threads to join them. At the end of the road, and quite out of breath, they, they slowed to a stop. It was a few minutes before Franey and Herb recovered. And by the time they did, it had started to snow. The boy flashed them a crooked half-smile through the golden lamplight lamp -like snowflakes. You owe me something, Franey, Franey scowled. 
What do you want with my hair anyway? He walked forwards, lifted a glossy dark ringlet from her shoulder and with a flash of his knife, severed it. A lot can be done with a lock of hair. You know more about that before you go giving it away. Well, you should know more about that before giving it away. That was what I was meant to say. Without it, we would still be back in that house with Mrs. Sector and the widow. The false widow, the boy corrected her. What's done is done and I expect you want to be going back now. West, was it? Franny and Herb nodded. So, all in all, giant spiders and mystical threadings and webbing and a very interesting look at the East End and Weaver's Way. I really hope that Weaver's Way doesn't exist because damn it. Missing pen, we need a discussion. This has been Storytime with Nat for Christmas special with The Weavers by Emily Inkpen. Have a good night.